You should look into Dan White's story. It's quite a eye opener. <laughs> So the next county jail story was Oakland. Well, the Oakland one uh, was... Um, the one you already did. No, it was in the ice house. And I must say, it, was, it didn't... I didn't shine on that one. It was... Uh, I'm sort of... I regret a bit what I did, but... Basically, what happened is I came into a cell. There were about 20 guys in the cell. About five Chicanos. One other white guy. An old guy and me, and the rest were blacks. And the white guy was making coffees for the blacks. That was his job. <laughs> and I thought to myself, this is a bad situation here, right? It could go bad any time. <sighs> and so I was doing my usual workout and the rest of it. And one day, this kind of young-looking white kid appears outside the bars with a mop, and he's mopping. And one of these guys says, yo, Peckerwood's a fucking rat. Ah, da, 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 da. And they start talking, race talk, and what they're going to do, and this and that, and this and that. And I'm thinking, well, you boys, and you won't be able to touch him, but I'm here, and uh, this other little white guy's here, so who knows? Anyway, I thought to myself, I got to get on the right side of uh, history here. So I go over to the black guys, a couple of black guys, and I said, uh, I'll get him over to the bars if you guys want to give him a whack. And uh, I told the old white guy, I said, make up a real hot cup of coffee. So I took a cup of coffee and I walked over to the bars and I called this guy. And he didn't want to come because he was nervous about these black guys. But the black guys all sort of turned their backs and were like looking the other way on the bench. And he was feeling safe. So he comes up to me and I just gave him the coffee in the face. And he's standing there screaming, and these black guys run over with this broom handle and through the bars, they're whacking him. And uh, pretty soon he's screaming, and pretty soon the guards come. And the guard just kind of smiles at them, and they smile at him, and he leads this kid away. And, you know, at that, at that point, I'm sort of one of the fellows, and we're all talking it up on the bench, right? Two things then. What was the beef with the white guy, with the, just from shit talking, and wouldn't that carry forward with the white race when you got moved somewhere else? Did this is the guy who sided with the blacks? Well, you know, the situation we were in, the blacks could take us out any moment. So the older white guy was making him coffees to to stay on the right side, and uh, you know, I realized it's just anybody says anything, and I, I, I'm done. There's nothing I can do against these 15 guys. Plus, they're all in for death penalty offenses. So, you know. Well, how, Preservation. So what are you going to do? So the kid, you know, you could tell what happened. He'd, he'd come from some white neighborhood in Alameda County, and nobody went his bail, so he was downstairs with the blacks. And, of course, he'd... he'd you know, got beat up and then told on them to get in PC to get out of there. So he brought it on himself. So he brought it on himself, but I was normally I wouldn't have done something like that. And I sort of regret doing it. But at the time, I thought it was the right move to make. So the next one then is YOLO. Well, the Yolo County one was uh, the fat black Michelin man. Oh, that was that one. Yeah. Shasta. That was the one we just talked about with Hohudi Croy. Okay, so last time. Oh, actually, actually, it isn't. There's one more thing about Shasta which is interesting. Shasta County Jail didn't have any money, hardly any. So they didn't spend money on food. So breakfast were two little silver dollar pancakes with a bit of syrup and one cup of coffee, two little silver dollar pancakes. And lunch was one piece of bread and two pieces of bologna. And that was it for breakfast and lunch. That must have made people hangry. Well, I realized I didn't have enough to eat because I like working out. And the only way I was going to get enough to eat was to take other um, sort of prisoners' food. So fortunately... There were about any, every day there were about three or four drunks in there. So I would go up in the morning 
take the trays and just take all their food. And the only guy I took the food to straight was Hootie Croy, because I had a bit of respect for what he did. And so, you know, there I was. And I asked, I asked this kid, I said, what's up with this food? And he says, oh, the county doesn't have any money and they're certainly not going to spend it on us. And it was, I guess it was a way of encouraging him to pay his fine or somebody to pay the fine. So I was actually, I had, and I'm not a, a sort of apex predator, but I still had to take other people's food to get enough to eat. That's what it reduces you to. So last time I asked several questions that you didn't really answer. For example, about representing in prison riots. Well, the, the closest I ever got to a riot was in Vacaville. Um, they had one TV in the TV room, but there were blacks, Chicanos, and whites. And dinner was at uh, like five o'clock in the afternoon, pretty early. And whoever came out of dinner first would be the first person who would turn on the TV and choose the channel. Well, that's the big responsibility. Uh, that's not one that I'd like to have. Mm. Coincidentally, starting at five o'clock, there was one program called American Bandstand. I don't know if you ever heard of it. American Bandstand was kind of like, a, you know, teenage pop music and kids would dance and popular music would be played and kids, and then it would showcased music, it, but white music. And at the same time, on a different channel, there was another program and it was the black music program. And it had black teenagers and they were doing black songs at five o'clock. So, this white kid, he he gave up on his Jello for for breakfast. I mean, for dessert, so that he could get out of the chow hall quickly, so he could go turn on American Bandstand. And he was a big guy. He was like six three, maybe two ten, two twenty, but he was sloppy. And he would sit right by the television, at the closest as he could sit, and he obviously for him, he was first. He got to choose what channel was on. Well, this afternoon came by and 20 young bloods decided to miss on their jello too. And they went over and sat in front of the TV. And the older one kind of looked at one and, and, he, and so the kid got up, black guy, went over and changed the channel from uh, to from American Bandstand to Soul Train. That was the name of Soul the Train, yeah. Soul Train, yeah. the black program. And he changed the channel and sat down. And this kid, you know, being a good, he must have been middle class kid because working class kid would have known better. He, he'd been there first and so, you know, he was gonna make the choice. So he got back up and changed it back to American Bandstand. Now the black kid stood up and I saw him look at the older guy, and the older guy gave him the nod. Now, I could see it from across the room what was going to happen, but this kid, he just was standing there, and the black just walked over and clocked him. Bam! And he fell like a bag of potatoes. Boom! On the ground. And the moment he fell, the black scooped up the folding metal chairs, and I was there with about four, five, six white guys, and then there were a bunch of other whites coming into the, the room. And as soon as I saw these guys pick up the chairs, I picked up a chair. And then I looked behind me, and there were only about five white guys behind me with chairs. And there were about 20 of them. And the other Caucasians were just running for the door to get out of the, uh, the TV room before you know, the guards came and locked up. And, and so we had this moment where the young blood's looking at me with the chair. He's about to give it to me in the face, and then he sees I've got the chair too, and he doesn't. And so the, the race riot, and then the guard, the alarms go off and the guards start screaming on the loudspeaker. And we, everybody drops their chairs and pretends it didn't happen. <laughs> so it was that close to the riot. 
that was the closest I ever got. And I, I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't see it as representing the white race. I just didn't want to get a mouthful of chair standing there like a goof, like this kid did. So most beefs are one on one. Did you see any other brawl, like mass brawls, multiple people joining in? Well, I, I guess I'm lucky because I got to Sierra Conservation Center and they just come off a lockdown for a riot. Do you remember the last podcast I told you about a, a huge black guy who got a weight bar across the head while he was, yeah. as, he was asleep? Yeah. Well, what had happened was this guy was massive and he had a ghetto blaster and he used to put on Soul Train or whatever it was, hardcore black music, loud. And he played it loud inside a dormitory. The dormitory's got 20 guys and they're racially mixed. And he didn't care because obviously he'd come straight from county jail, maybe a little bit of time in Vacaville to the Sierra Conservation Center. He'd never been in, in a serious prison or he wouldn't have done that for sure. So he was disrespecting everybody in the dorm by doing that. But he was so big, he didn't care. He just thought, I'll, you know. And so once, one day he was off doing something and these two guys, um, they took his ghetto blaster and they put it in a bucket of water and put it on top of his pillow to give him the message. And he came back into the cell, I mean, into the, the, the dorm, and he took one look at this, and he looked around at everybody, and he says, I killed the motherfucker, does this disrespect me, blah, 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 to everybody in the dorm. Now, that's another, like, giant no-no. I mean, you just, you just put it on everybody in the dorm, not even waiting to pick out who you thought, but just on everybody. Anyway, so then he takes his ghetto blaster outside and leaves it to dry in the sun. And it, you know, probably would have dried. And then he goes to sleep. Well, you know, he goes to sleep and this guy, Leo, and his road dog, Harmonic Mike, Leo has, goes, gets a weight bar, one of these little uh, ones you put the dumbbells on, and he just crushes the guy's skull with one shot. And of course, the blacks, someone comes in to see him, finds his body there, runs out, tells the blacks, they just attack all the Peckerwoods who are on the weight pit. You know, all the guys with the tattoos, they're on the weight pit. And the blacks attack them with like broken chair legs and, you know, whatever they can find. Except attacking people in the weight pit is like the dumbest thing you can do because they've got all the iron. They've got the weight bars and they've got the, the weights. And so the race ride, boom, it just takes off guns, shooting, et cetera, et cetera. So when I got there, this, the, the lockdown had just finished. And because of this riot, because they knew, the guards knew exactly why it started, because of noise, because the blacks' acceptance of noise, their level that, which they could put up with noise was really high. Have you ever heard the expression, um, they smell, they tell, and they yell? Mm -mm. That's what the old white convicts used to say about the blacks, right? Because they love to slap dominoes on the steel tables and shout. And anyway, the guards knew why this happened. And so they, after the riot, instituted a quiet dorm system. So there was a dorm where there was, you weren't allowed to have any music. There was no loud talking, no game playing, and you had to be quiet and you had to be introduced by another prisoner who was already going into, into that cell. And of course, the only people that went in there are white. So it became like a white only dormitory. And of course, that's where I wanted to be. Yeah. So yeah, that was the background of, of that race ride. So I missed that one also. And then in Canada, I missed the great Matsqui prison ride, which you've probably never heard of because nobody knows anything about things Canadian. But it, it, they burned the entire cell block and the guards escaped like the American uh, 
CIA guys from the Saigon embassy. You ever seen those videos? <laughs> Where they're all climbing on the helicopter as it makes its way out, and the place is burning up. And in the Matsqui, it was a medium uh, security prison where all the you know lively gunsels go. And they tore it down completely. It took about a year for it to be fixed. And the prisoners all lived out in tents out in the yard for a year. So I missed that one. So I actually was very lucky because I went through my prison time, aside from that you know, Soul Train versus... Um, American bandstand, escaping these uh, uh, prison riots. Because, of course, in the riot, then it is going to kick off. And what are you going to do? You can't, you can't say, well, I'm not part of this. <laughs> Go represent. <laughs> so. How did you manage to get into the quiet building? Well, I mean, I, I, I'd spend money for things like that. I mean whatever it was, five packs of cigarettes, I'd get it on the list, however it was, because the biggest thing for me was quiet. If it was, if I could get a good night's sleep, I was fine. If I couldn't get a good night's sleep, then I was doing a hard time. Yeah, it teaches you to value things like food and sleep, doesn't it, going through experiences like this? Mm. So, so I would tell any guy who wants to do good time, I'd say, work out till you're exhausted and get a good night's sleep. And then, you know, one, you've kept yourself fit. Two, you, you, you're not going to be worried, thinking about all the mistakes you made in your life. And three, you wake up with a good attitude. So Yeah, or exhaust yourself for a really physical job. Mm. When I was in the clipper room in the kitchen, washing those trays all day, oh, oh, I slept really, like a baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so all these news stories about police brutality... And you've had some experiences or seen some stuff. Well, my experience with police brutality, of two of them, um, first one, I didn't even know these guys. I didn't even know what happened. Um, I was walking along. Remember I told you um, I'd been shoplifting when I escaped just to sort of, and these guys had been moonlighting as security guards, three policemen from the San Francisco Police Department. And I'd been shoplifting, but I wasn't actually um, doing it at the moment when they came along, but they'd obviously been told that I'd been shoplifting. And I just, I was thrown on the ground and choked out in about five seconds. I didn't even, it was so fast, I didn't even know what happened. One guy, these guys were like a professional team. One guy was on each arm, one guy was on my back, rode me onto the ground, and he choked me out in about five seconds. And he had this feeling of this incredible weight on my back and I didn't know where I was and didn't know what happened and I couldn't breathe. And, you know, it, it was that fast. Uh, you choke someone out properly, you put them out almost instantly. So that was, I had, it, it, was, it happened so fast, I, I can't even, I haven't got any memory of, of much of it. But when I came to, I was very unhappy with what had happened. When I went, um, when I came to, I wasn't happy with what happened because they'd arrested me and I was an escapee from prison and this wasn't going to end well. So they threw me in the police car and they shut the doors. But when they threw me in the police car, I didn't hear the double click. Now, the back door, there's a security lock and then there's the regular lock. So when they slam the door shut, the regular lock engages. But then the police has a button they can push to put the security lock so you can't open it from the inside. I didn't hear the second lock go. So I thought, oh, this is interesting. So they had me cuffed like this behind my back. So in the back of the car, without them noticing, I had to sort of shiggle around and get my, arm, my legs through the cuffs. And so I got the cuffs in front of me. And then as the police car went down the ramp into the basement of the police station, I yarded open the door and rolled out on the ramp and took off running. <laughs> well, I'm running right down the middle of like, you know, it's like middle of the day in sort of San Francisco down to Main Street, right down the middle of the street with my handcuffs. But if, if you're wearing handcuffs, it really makes running difficult. I don't know, well, you've obviously never done it. 
and who would? <laughs> <laughs> but you lose your balance. You're running, but you can't, uh. you know? So you, you're not running. I'm, I'm pretty quick at running, but I, I wasn't running with, with proper uh, vigor. And it turned out that the guy who was driving the car was a marathoner, the cop. And, I, you know, I could hear him coming, and he was getting closer. And I thought, how can this be? I'm pretty quick. But he was quicker than me. And as I turned to look back at him, I bounced off a car and crashed into another one and fell oh. on the ground. And anyway, these guys were pissed off now because I'd done a rabbit on them. And not only that, but they're going to have to tell their sergeant that they hadn't double-clicked the door. So when they got me back down to the basement, it was time for a beating. So the three of them went to it, you know, fisticuffs and kicks and the rest of it. Now, you've got two choices when the police start beating you. One, you can go Bruce Cagney style, you know, and stand up and say, fuck you, pig, and then you get your teeth kicked out. Or two, you can ham it up. So that's what I did. Every time the guy kicked me, I was, oh, and groaning and, you know, like, like I was about to die. Anyway. Is it a fetal position situation? It's a fe well, you've got to keep moving, though, because if you, let, if you stay still, then the guy's kick gets solid velocity and gets solid contact. But if you're moving all the time, the kicks bounce off and don't get the full impact. So you so got to stay moving. So you got to do a maggot thing. Yeah, and keep moving as you're getting the, the boots and the kicks and the punches. See, we give you tips on situations that you've never heard before. <laughs> anyway, the sergeant comes down, and the sergeant looks at me, and he, he's hearing this noise. And he looks at the guys, and he says, he's not even bleeding. So he, he was a veteran of beating people up. He, he knew what to look for. He knew when they'd actually got, got it, right? And he was unhappy that these patrolmen had let me sort of uh, game it a bit, you know. Did he take over? No, no, he was, he's a sergeant. He's kind of risen above that, right? <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those situations that, uh, I mean, my grandfather, he was taken prisoner by the Germans, World War I. And in the prison camp, he ran into this Prussian officer who spoke some English. And the Prussian officer asked him about this guy, this German who had a big business in the same province my grandfather came from. And my grandfather smarted off with him and said the guy was a fucking pig or something. And the German just pulled out his pistol and knocked out my grandfather's teeth, all his front teeth. Bam! For all my life, all his life, my grandfather had false teeth because for two seconds or however long it took, he smarted off when he should have stayed quiet. So I still have my teeth, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you lived in a black ghetto for a while at a halfway house, which was an eye-opening experience. It was. Um, you, do you remember, because... That San, in San Quentin, the BGF guys tried to kill me. Um, we, I got out of the punitive North Block because some black guys assigned a petition saying I wasn't into this race stuff. Well, when I got released onto a halfway house program, the same way racial, quota, racial quotas work where a white halfway house would have to have some blacks, a black halfway house has to have a few token whites. So I ended up down at the Volunteers of America uh, halfway house in East Oakland, the middle of a hardcore black ghetto, like East 113th Street or whatever it was, I don't remember. And I had to walk to the bus, to the bus stop through this ghetto from the halfway house every day and then walk back. And about the third morning, as I was walking, there was a there was a side street that was I used to go down, and the Sally Ann, their their uh, furniture place where people throw old furniture and they give it to the homeless. They the homeless had taken all this old furniture and sort of blocked the street off and would have street parties that kind of thing. All the old hobos and street people. And as I was walking along, I looked across and there was a dead body. 
in the gutter and his throat had been slashed like completely open it was leaning back and the flies were in it this is like nine o'clock in the morning and i looked at this and i thought shit i don't want to be around here so i just quickly headed off now here's the kicker when i came back at 5 30 it was still there it was still there and it was still there for the same reason nobody wanted to be the person who phoned the police and told them it was there because they'd be the first person the police would accuse of doing it. Mm. They'd be the one who'd get jacked. And so we're talking in the United States of America. You're talking third world situation. I've been in countries like all kinds of third world countries. You'll never see stuff like that. But this was a dead body all day long in East Oakland in the gutter. Wow. So we're almost at two hours, John. Are there any stories that I have left out today or oh, anything no, that you want to say? Two hours is good. You don't want to tax these guys' patience too much. <laughs> Do you think if the viewers put questions below this video that you would come back and answer those questions and maybe give us yeah, some stories? Yeah, that would be no problem. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so if you are watching this then, please put your f um, further questions for John in the comments below this video. We really hope you've enjoyed it. Huge thank you to the new subscribers. Subscription logos in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Huge thank you to people who donated so we can film in podcast studios with James, our cameraman, and Joe, our sound engineer. All those links, PayPal, Patreon, just give in, are in the description box as our links to the socials and the True Crime Podcast. Well over 100 videos. Hours and hours of endless entertainment. But I do urge you to go down and watch podcast number eight. San Quentin prison shootout and escapes because it is if you th think what you just heard was hardcore it's, it's, it's intense especially um, the shootout stories and how you know it was, it was life and death it was like whew, it will really get your heart rate up so thanks for coming on might be too hot to man hug yeah it's a, it's a pleasure <laughs> yes, excellent yes, yes thank you no no it's good, uh, it's good. excellent